Good afternoon. All right. Thank you very much, everyone who traveled from far distances to spend today with you, with us. Uh, really, really proud uh, to join here and share uh, a little bit about connecting the front line. Uh, and really, really proud to be um, representing Asia Pacific uh, for our business. And what's special about Workplace is that it truly is a global platform. And as we heard this morning, the impact of building a connected company and more importantly, a connected community is really felt on the front line. And I'm really honored to share the stage today with two global executives that work for two very iconic Asian companies to talk about the impact that Workplace has had on connecting the front line. So please help me and welcome Varun Bhatia, the Chief People Officer and Chief Culture Officer at Air Asia. And Jin Montesano, who's the Chief People Officer and Public Affairs Officer at Lixil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So a fun fact of these two, as they've worked around the world for various uh, important multinational organizations, actually worked together uh, at Kraft Foods <laughs> yes. at a different time of life. So He recruited me. <laughs> great banter. Best thing I ever did, I think. <laughs> <laughs> great. Varun, I'd love for you to share a little bit about AirAsia. And the interesting piece about the front line as we talk about it is that for different organizations, it means different types of employees. Can you share what that means for AirAsia? Sure. So I can't see the audience here, but uh, you know we have about 25,000 employees. We call them all stars because each one is a star. And uh, we believe everybody has the potential to contribute at the front line. Uh, out of the 25,000 employees, we got about 20,000 who are our operational staff, who are more in touch with the uh, with the ground as well as at 30,000 feet with our passengers being an airline. And about 5,000 are back office and commercial staff. So uh, technically the 20,000 folks, about 80% of the organization is the front line. Mm -hmm. uh, though we don't necessarily think of a front line like that. I think each and every employee in today's world is at the front line, especially with social media and how customers connect with you and your organization. I think everybody has to be connected to the front line. So it's the CEO and the C-suite and the management folks. Uh, you know, they need to be connected with the on-the-ground realities. And uh, the rest of the organization, they need to understand the strategy of the organization, where the organization is heading, uh, and also the plan. So you know, we get uh, to understand the front line very differently, I would say, because each and every person is at the front line. They have different roles, but they play at the front line. Julian this morning talked about the founder's mentality and the notion of the importance the front line has to connect the entire organization, particularly those uh, CEOs that are engaged. I know uh, your boss, Tony Fernandez, is very engaged on the front line. Can you talk about how that has been able to reduce the distance in the organization? Sure. You know, the aviation industry is a highly regulated industry and uh, we've got operations in different countries around Asia. Now, in most countries, in all countries, actually, uh, we cannot have a majority equity shareholding in any of those countries in which we operate. So even from a regulatory perspective, there are walls between different countries and our employees in those countries. So uh, we haven't let those regulatory walls come in the way as we've tried to manage the company. And we have been embarking on this uh, one air Asia mission to bring all employees under same roof of AirAsia, uh, getting them the same experiences, the employee experiences, as well as making sure that they understand where the entire group is heading. So uh, when we were small, uh, and Tony bought two planes for one dollar and a debt of 200 million bucks, uh, you know, he could connect with everybody. But now we have 25,000 employees. Mm. So Workplace has been wonderful because it's really broken down those walls, both the regulatory walls as well as the walls of uh, you know, people being in different countries and different cultures. 
and it truly speaks to our mission. Our mission is, uh, very clearly has been stated from the beginning, is now everyone can fly. Now, it's such an inclusive mission, uh, being a low-cost airline, I think it's almost internally also the same kind of mission, that now everyone can connect, everyone can be part of the same company. And uh, because of that, you know, last 18 years we existed in that part of the world where, uh, you know, in the airlines business and in countries like in which we uh, operate, uh, most airlines are unionized. I mean, all airlines are unionized. We are the only airline which is not unionized across any of the countries in which we operate. And that's a testament to the kind of open, transparent, and literally boundaryless organization we have, where every employee uh, can connect with uh, senior management. And, you know, Tony, as you said, you know, starts uh, by being a role, role model, and he uses workplace very, very effectively, and uh, breaks down the walls, and people can tell him anything. In fact, uh, recently he was at a workplace live um, chat with the entire organization doing a town hall, and uh, he, he had not been very well, so, you know, he had not gone to the barber. So, uh, as part of his talking about the strategy of the company, he said, let me ask everybody, should I get a haircut or not? <laughs> and we did a poll. And, you know, that's... <laughs> so, it, it's, it's that kind of an organization where we want feedback, not only on serious matters, but, uh, you know, we make fun of the fact that, you know, the founder, the CEO, and the senior people can connect with everybody. That's great. That's great. Jin, that sounds similar but in a very different context mm. to, um, to some of the challenges that you're, you and your team are solving at Lixil. Can you share a little bit more for those of us um, who are not as familiar with Lixil and some of those challenges that you see? Okay, thank you. Well, man, many of you won't know Lixil, but we're actually one of the world's, world's largest housing and water technology companies. We're definitely the largest player in Japan. Uh, we make everything from the smallest thing in your house, like the tap, to the shower system, to the kitchens, bath systems. We're very famous for our toilets. And um, because we're the only company in the world that makes the $5,000 kind that do everything. And actually, a $5 toilet for the 1.3 billion people in the world today who have no access to basic sanitation. Um, our challenge is that two thirds of our employees, we have 70,000 around the world in 150 countries, um, two thirds of our employees are frontline. They're in 100 factories and manufacturing sites around the world. Uh, we've got over 80 showrooms across just Japan and another 200 across the world, um, as well as sales sites and so forth. And we are so vastly networked but fragmented. I mean, these are really the frontline workers who are you know, on the road, mobile first, not connected to a computer, without email. So when we became Lixol, um, one of the first things we did was to think about what does it mean to be Lixel? We came together through this artificial group of mergers and acquisitions, and we had to really figure out what our true purpose was. And in the end, we decided through lots of workshops and discussions that our purpose was really quite simple, that there is one universal truth um, that we all hold as humans, and that is that we always dream of a better home, a dream home. No matter where you live in the world, no matter how much money you earn, um, having a better home is your dream. And we believe we make better homes a reality for everyone everywhere. And that includes the person who might be remodeling their bathroom because they're empty nesters, or the family who's getting their first toilet in Nairobi. And as far as we're concerned, making that happen, aligning the organization around this purpose, and really activating that across this fragmented group, including two-thirds of our population, which is on the front line, we really needed to transform the company culture-wise. Japanese companies are very traditional, very hierarchical, very formal. Um, there is a, a, such a thing as one voice um, is equal. So one voice, one opinion is not equal in a hierarchical organization. And that's really been you know, the power of Facebook for, for us and Workplace, because it democratized uh, opinions, and it created a very uh, neutral and flat way for everyone to communicate and share their opinions. And that's how we discovered the power of actually tapping into the front line, as silly as that sounds, because we were so siloed and so hierarchical, there was virtually no way for these vast populations across the world that are really at the coalface, talking to our customers, our distributors, our end users, 
to give us the inputs we needed to continue to be relevant with our brands, like American Standard, Groe, Inax, and so forth. So today, um, if you said to me, what is the most common element of the work you're doing to transform Lixil to become one company, I'd say it's the launch of our new Lixil behaviors and workplace. That has really become the foundational way we will build to activate this global community. And giving everyone a voice in the context of, you know, breaking down some of the barriers in traditional corporate culture in Japan. Um, can you share about the impact Workplace had in a recent leadership transition? Right. Um, so, so many of you may not know this, but we also became famous for something else in Japan this year. Um, do, so Kenya Seto, our CEO, is actually a serial founder and entrepreneur. And he had come in, to the company in 2016. But, last, but in October of last year, um, through questionable governance, um, he actually resigned from the company. And it kicked off basically nine months of what was an unprecedentedly um, dramatic shareholder struggle, where major institutional shareholders stepped forward to say, uh, we're calling this one, we think there's something very fishy about this, and we challenge the management. This was Facebook, we had launched Workplace maybe eight months um, before this all happened. So we were still trying to get people on board to this platform. And Japan is 50% of our population, so it's really important to get Japan on. And they were coming on in, at quite a rapid speed when this exploded. Well, in another unprecedented move, the CEO who was deposed, Kinya Seto, decided he would fight back. So he and top institutional shareholders mounted a shareholder action to essentially reverse the situation and get rid of the management that took over. Facebook is the hidden figure in the story. Workplace became the place where everyone could convene and discuss what exactly is going on. Do you understand what's the situation? The reporters and the media are reporting this. What do you understand this to be? All of a sudden, my team that's managing Workplace would come to me and say, um, we have a situation coming together. And I said, what do you mean? Well, we're tracking now a group we call the Kami Seven. Kami means God and seven. So the seven gods of workplace <laughs> had emerged during this period. And they were essentially key influencers. These guys didn't know each other. We just called them that. But essentially, you had a guy out in Hokkaido, a guy sitting in Chiba in procurement, somebody from IT you know, just, just down the road. You had these seven characters who took it upon themselves to help really digest and simplify what all was going on. Now, you might be wondering, what was the corporate comms team doing at this time? I and mean, you're in a major <laughs> crisis. The corporate comms team was fighting to keep the management from closing, face, closing down workplace. So they, they were not understanding it. They thought we, this workplace thing was creating more noise and engendering conflict. They wanted us to shut it down. And it was a very, you know, very tormenting period, and it was quite controversial. And I basically said, you'll have to fire me because I'm not shutting this thing down. And um, at that point, they were very worried about losing C-suite executives. They didn't want to create more foment. Investors are now getting very upset we were generating something like 1,100 articles on this subject every month. So you can imagine what the media team was dealing with at the time. And I run investor relations and media. That was basically what I was doing before I took over the HR piece um, as well. And so we were really at the cold face, and we didn't want to fuel it by um, encouraging and, and explaining what was happening. But we were working behind the scenes with the Kami Seven to help them understand and actually post and, and just get on with it because we didn't really do that much. But Workplace became this incredibly relevant and very powerful platform where everyone who thought that this company is not owned by these individuals, this is our company, and it really created this philosophical question within the company. And then in the Nikkei and in the media landscape, who is the true owner of a company? Who really owns a company? And 
on Workplace, employees said, we own this company. We create the corporate value. We should have a say in this. And it just completely changed the way employees were thinking about Workplace. Not a corporate platform, but a vital way to stay connected during this extremely um, unprecedented period. I, I won't go into great detail, but basically, at the annual general meeting of shareholders, in a shock result, that management was thrown out and Kenya Seto was reappointed back as CEO. And it's the first time it's ever happened in Japanese corporate history. So we're quite pioneering in a number of ways. <laughs> and uh, Workplace was a hidden figure in that drama. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> Varun, you have also seen at AirAsia some really interesting creative ways that the organization has adopted workplace and really to fight some of the social issues uh, of the region. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, nothing as exciting as the Jins, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no overthrowing governments and leaders. But uh, in our case, uh, you know, human trafficking in Asia is a big issue. And um, a lot of the trafficking happens through airlines. And because we are an airline, uh, you know, we took it upon ourselves to take on the responsibility of um, uh, figuring out how do we uh, deal with this. So uh, we have an AirAsia Foundation which is focused on doing charitable uh, work. And they came up with a program working with some uh, lawyers and anti-trafficking uh, activists to put together a program on how to spot and identify uh, traffickers. And we uh, train our 6,000 frontline cabin crew as well as uh, ground staff you know, on that program and basically uh, created a group on Workplace and put all the training material there, uh, kept reinforcing what are the signs of uh, trafficking and uh, getting people to share stories of when they had identified human trafficking and how, uh, you know, they could share those stories and get other people aware. And that has helped in the recent past for us to identify uh, such issues and um, basically take people to task. So I thought that was something which Workplace really uh, helped us to do. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So for those in the audience today that perhaps is not going through um, leadership struggles. Mm -hmm. um, We're what, done now. <laughs> What's, what's advice or, or a takeaway you would give those um, that, are, that are looking to have a similar high level of engagement? I mean, particularly given um, both of your experiences um, working around the globe. Um, maybe, Jin, to start with you, what, what's one takeaway that people can take from here? Um, well, we didn't set a lot of hard rules. We actually let it play pretty loosely um, we, to get Japanese on board, you really have to create the environment that it's safe and it's okay. That psychological safety is really critical. That you're not going to, there's not going to be retribution for getting on the system and talking. Um, I think, I think just the vast numbers of the Japanese population that have come online really underscores how much they wanted to share their voice but couldn't because of keigo and honorific language and hierarchy and so forth. So actually, um, for me, I think obviously leadership support to land it and make it legitimate and explain the why, but then managers really need to create that environment to encourage people to get on. And I think that has been really um, the most important aspect of getting Facebook, I mean Workplace, getting going at Lixel. All right, thank you. Varun, uh, AirAsia was one of our uh, early adopters of Workplace. Um, and you've had experience in some really kind of innovative ways that have used it to integrate Workplace into the full tech stack to be able to provide that value to the front line. Mm -hmm. what, what advice would you give, again, for global leaders here in the audience today as they're thinking about um, having some of the same impact that, that you've been able to, to share with us? Sure. Now, everybody's going to have a different situation uh, in terms of your own internal culture and, you know, how workplace uh, becomes a part of that. For us, um, you know, it was literally an extension of who we were, the personality of our CEO, as well as the organization. 
So it, it became seamless in terms of us having workplace um, being implemented. Uh, but some of the learnings for us were it really, like Jin said, starts from the top. I mean, leadership has to role model it, use it. I think everybody says that, but in our case, you know, Tony, uh, my boss, I use it like nobody else. And sometimes I wish he didn't use it like nobody else. <laughs> because he'll say things which, you know, that we'll be scrambling in HR, right, trying I, to fix. I so, uh, but, you know, I, I think it's all for the right reasons. Uh, so leadership has to role model it. Secondly, I would uh, suggest start with social interest topics mm. because I think people gravitate that, to that much more easily uh, as you start off rolling workplace. Uh, prime example for us uh, was a foodies group, which you know, everybody wanted to be part of. Uh, we also uh, were building a new corporate headquarters and we call it Red Q. Red is our color uh, instead of HQ, Red Q. And in fact, uh, we used Workplace to launch the naming contest of what will we call our headquarters and uh, got a lot of entries through Workplace. And once we got the winner, you know, we made a big splash on Workplace about that. But as this corporate headquarters was being built, there were four stray dogs, puppies, uh, who were around the construction site. So once the corporate headquarters was ready uh, in KL, uh, we built a dog shelter and again, to name the dog shelter, we had a contest through Workplace. And employees came up with the name Dog Q. Aww. Yeah, and that became the next group which became very popular uh, in terms of social interest and people you know, really started using Workplace, going to Workplace to get stories about what's happening at Dog Q. And so start with social interest stories and then I think move on to uh, ways where you get people to go there for their daily information, daily tasks. That's really critical because um, we, we figured that if you don't make it uh, that, then people will lose interest in some of the social activities and you know, go to the place where they go to get work done. Mm -hmm. uh, so even simple things like when we launched Workday, uh, you know, we were trying to get away from emails, but Workday pushes notifications through emails. Mm -hmm. And we said, that's not acceptable because you know, we've launched Workplace and we're trying to get people away from emails into social media. Uh, so this is going to be counterintuitive. So we worked with Workday and Workplace, and we were told we can't integrate both of them. Uh, but not taking no for an answer, we worked with Workplace and Workday, and uh, we came up with an integration where now all our notifications from Workday go on Workplace notifications on chat. So it's really worked out well, so people have to go to Workplace chat to get notifications on their Workday activities. Uh, besides that, you know, we made sure no announcements were made through emails. All announcements were made through workplace uh, work, uh, and, uh, and also chat, work, work chat. And we also made sure that any uh, town halls were done live. In fact, very quick story. You know, we, uh, we were in London uh, for the Skytrax Awards. Skytrax is the Oscars for airlines. And uh, we've, uh, you know, we've been fortunate that we've won 11 years in a row the world's best low-cost airline in beating Southwest and EasyJet and Ryanair, etc. Uh, so last year when it was in London, the 10th one was a big one. So we used Workplace to uh, have a Workplace Live uh, broadcast. Mm. And it was like the Oscars. You, nobody knew, our employees didn't know whether we were going to win it. But the 10th one was a big one. So uh, six big locations, employees were there, uh, you know, watching these big screens. Workplace Live was uh, being broadcast. And Lo and behold, you know, the announcer announced AirAsia as uh, the winner. Okay. And that was such a powerful moment of workplace coming together and helping us celebrate and, you know, getting our employees connected. That's fantastic. Awesome. That's Thank awesome. you. Um, final question inspired because of uh, Dog Q. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite group on workplace and why? Uh, the foodies group. Oh. <laughs> and Jin, for you? Um, we have a Sato group, which is the $5 toilet group. So they use that as their own platform um, because uh, I run a social enterprise called Sato Safe Toilet. It's uh, toilets for the uh, base of the pyramid. And that group is virtual. I mean, our teams are sitting in you know, Nairobi and in Uganda and in um, you know, Orissa Prefecture. They're everywhere except in Tokyo. 
But what's happened is it's exploded because people who are not working on Sato really want to know what's going on with Sato. How are we working with UNICEF? How are we partnering with Coke or Unilever or other companies? And that's actually become almost an internal platform to share and give ideas and connect Sato team. Um, so they're sort of accidentally leveraging uh, the power of resources within the company because everybody wants to support the social enterprise. So that's my favorite group because it really, I think, exemplifies uh, the power of workplace. Well, thank you both for. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, thank you both thank you. Uh, thank for you. joining and sharing your stories today. Thank, thank you. you.